and welcome to the webinar we have today, How Life Cycle Assessment Underpins Product Sustainability. Thank you for joining us. Tudor is delighted to have with us Alexander Hardwick of PE International and Nicholas Avery of Tata Steel. Now, before we begin, I'm going to give a few technical instructions for the webinar. If you have problems with the technology or audio, please the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen to send a message. Select from the drop-down menu, send your message, and then I'll get back to you. Now, I encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we're going to hold a Q&A session at the end. So to ask your questions or to give your comments, type into the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, and then press send. If you'd like to connect through your phone, click the chat box to contact me for those details. Now, with that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Alex for the first part of our presentation. Alex? Right, you want to hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you now. That's great. Um, hi, uh, my name is, is Alex Hardwick, and um, yes, welcome to the webinar, which is indeed entitled How Life Cycle Assessment Underpins Sustainability. Um, so, before we, before we get into it, I'd like to just introduce uh, the two of us who are going to be, be speaking today. Uh, my name is, is Alex. I'm a senior consultant with PE International. Um, I'm based in our Sheffield office in the United Kingdom, and I work on a, a wide range of product sustainability um, projects with uh, um, partner UK and, and the Nordic countries. And in particular, um, sort of my specialist area is in metals and mining. Um, so I've had a lot of contact over the years with Tata, which is me very nicely on to Nick, who's a, a principal researcher. With, with Tata Steel. Um, you just introduce yourself very quickly. Uh, I've, um, hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm working for Tata Steel for uh, around about uh, 30 years now and um, most of that has been in, in the field of LCA. So uh, I work with the um, group environment function, um, working mainly in product sustainability. Anyway, yeah, so um, let's look at uh, our, our motivation, really, for, for holding this, this webinar today. And, and it really came out of a recent two-series live event where Vanessa and her colleagues compiled a list of some of the top issues that companies felt were affecting their sustainability efforts. Now, I think in total there were about um, 25 issues that were drawn out of this, but I think I'd like to just, just today on on five of the key ones here. Um, so, so the first one that came up was that come felt there was a need for some case studies on product innovation. Perhaps they were at the beginning of their sustainability journeys and they wanted to see how other companies might have dealt with some of the issues they were facing. And that's really our motivation for inviting Tata today to talk about their experiences in, in dealing with uh, all of the uh, all issues and all of the opportunities that they've managed to, to realize out of it. Um, the second here is, is that there was a lack of industry standards. Uh, perhaps the, the company that there was a, a lack of consistency in the way also that companies were reporting their sustainability efforts. Uh, and again, through through Tata, what we're hoping to do is that uh, Tata have, have conducted a number of benchmarking studies. They've also made use of EPDs. Um, so so this is one of the ways that they've managed to to cut across. Um, the various ways of communicating sustainability performance. Uh, for energy hotspots it is key. Was another was another big driver. Obviously, um, minimising energy costs is, is not only good from a from an environmental but also from an economic point of view. Uh, I think what we'll see is that, uh, particularly in the metals industry, this has been a, a big issue for a number of years. Uh, and uh, Tata aim not to only tackle its energy but also its resource issues. Quantifying our own waste, and again, I think this is, is something which many companies have uh, to do. Uh, and looking at uh, getting good data is crucial. And I think a very good example here where, where Tata, through their efforts with supply chain, uh, their col collaboration with, uh, with us at PE, and through the wider efforts um, of the steel industry through World Steel and so on and so forth, have made really significant steps to try and improve the quality of their data. And hopefully you'll get some ideas. Um, about how that, that might be achievable in you know in your various sectors. So quick agenda then. Um, uh, quick introduction to PE um, International as a company. 
Um, they're going to introduce some of the product sustainability drivers to try and frame some of what Nick is going to say. A lot of some of the opportunities that are out there, um, so both risks and opportunities. Then I'm going to hand it over to Nick, who will who will speak um, about some of the efforts that they've been giving. Just just give a, a snapshot of some of the insights and the experiences that they've had, uh, and we're hoping to leave a, a good amount of time for questions. So, um, as Vanessa said, in the Q&A box, send any questions you have, and we'll try and um, bring as many of them as we can uh, towards the end of the presentation. So, Peak International, um, we're a company that specialises in sustainability. And performance of both uh, products and enterprises. Um, uh, we provide consulting expertise, software solutions, as well as uh, sustainability data and content to, to a range of international clients. Um, we've got 25 offices. I'm somewhere under the green dot in the United Kingdom, um, but we've got a presence on about six continents. So we're a pretty global, uh, global operation. Uh, and what we sort of aim to do is really try and take companies all the way through their sustainability journey. So uh, right from the initial stages of trying to understand what their environmental or uh, sustainability impact is, so right back to data collection and benchmarking, as well as complying with, with regulations. Uh, we look to uh, help them realize the benefits that they'd be able to get out of it by creating a, a sort of more sustainability strategy, and then move into uh, trying to improve their sustainability performance as improving their products and processes. And ultimately, if all of that is a success, uh, then what it can deliver is um, improved environmental, economic, and social performance. So that's, that's kind of what we're, we're trying to do in the, in the end. At some of the, the drivers that we've kind of picked, I mean, our work with industry has shown that there are obviously a wide range of drivers, but you can kind of start to group them into a, to a few distinct um, areas. Uh, so, I mean, as well as the pressures from stakeholders, be they NGOs or, or the public at large, um, companies are coming under increasing pressure in terms of, um, you know, regulatory compliance. There's an increasing amount of environmental legislation, um, and many companies are now trying to stay ahead of legislative changes, so they're trying to avoid um, out and minimizing that kind of risk. Uh, as I'm what we've got here, reducing uh, resource and energy impacts, I mean, this just makes economic sense as well as having a very positive effect on, uh, on environmental impact. Um, and then looking up, up and downstream, working with the supply chain, of course, many companies have identified that many of their impacts lie, lie outside of their boundaries, so trying to engage uh, with supply chain partners to do a uh, that as effectively as possible. Into that, I think many, if not most, companies are ultimately in, interested in you know, innovating and trying to create new and better products for their customers. And so these two circles at the bottom here in terms of selling sustainable products, designing for environments, and so on, um, are really important. And at the same time, uh, all companies are being uh, pressured for information. So I would say that in terms of all the, the other um, bosses obtain incredible information, something that's defensible, something that's that's really, really important to companies, making sure that um, they have a strong mesh uh, and it's something that they, they feel that comfortable with and that they can back up. So as drivers, uh, there are also a number of, of opportunities. And uh, I think, you know, it's kind of important to try and, try and see these. So it's not just um, something which uh, has to be done. It's something which you can actually gain some some uh, advantage out of, and I think that um, you know, obviously, in the first the first instance, complying with regulation is is essential. That's you know, maintaining your right to operate essentially. So so without you struggle, but missing energy and resource costs are, are probably then the next logical steps. Um, obviously, those those that reduce operating costs as well as presenting good environmental message, and then I think what hopefully we'll hear from Nick a bit later on is that. Um, you know, the leading companies are looking to go beyond this compliance and cost reduction phase and, and really try and engage with their supply chains uh, in order to deliver, you know, better innovative products, uh, the kind of products that, you know, hopefully the market is, is demanding um, uh, with their supply chain up and downstream to try and identify what the innovations might be, what, what, you know, their downstream customers are hearing, what their upstream customers 
are experiencing as well. And I think Nick's hopefully going to be able to speak to all of those later on. And, and at the same time, I think minimizing risk is, is, is set to all of this. Companies are aiming to provide this credible, robust information to, to regulators, to stakeholders, to their supply chain, forging those links between all of those groups and at the same time trying to minimize any potential risks to their company and brand. And I think really all of those, um, what you've been able to see and what I hope that we will be able to demonstrate is that all of those drivers uh, and those opportunities uh, can or, or are inherently linked to cycle assessment uh, in terms of identifying energy and resource hotspots. That is often a very direct result of conducting an LCA. Uh, LCA data and, and so on can also help companies to make more informed decisions, so helping to, to you know, design these products and differentiate these products, because of course the more you know about your system, the better the chance you have to make a, a positive, informed improvement decision. Um, at the same time, obviously, this uh, uh, that's often involved engaging with the supply chain, which then help forge these links and cement these um, you know, custom client uh, links, which are so important. And report product information transparently, as I said, is, is then central to things like EPDs, which hopefully Nick will talk about environmental product declarations, but um, you know, it's a core outcome of LCA work, and it's one of the direct results um, you know, in terms of being able to differentiate your products in, in quite a crowded market. So life assessment really can be seen as a, as a lens uh, to try and assess your entire business and supply chain. It looks all the way along. It takes into account all of the uh, material and energy flows, right from material extraction through to recycling and final disposal. So hopefully you're not missing anything, which is always you know important. I think what kind of a critical importance as well is that the cycle assessment is aiming to um, assess environmental, social, economic performance, and so on and so forth, and it's aiming to avoid the shifting of burdens to other parts of the life cycle, uh, or perhaps also making poorly informed decisions uh, on single issues. So this is obviously really important to companies. Um, with this in mind, uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Nick, uh, who um, has already introduced himself to you, uh, and kind of frame what he's about to say. I'd, uh, I'd like to use three questions to him, which I suppose are, you know, what were the drivers that Tata Steel experienced? Um, how did they address them? And what opportunities did you manage to come across and, and how did you do the most out of them? So, um, Nick, and welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, I'll just take you uh, to the next slide, which um, really gives you um, the timeline that Tata Steel has gone through in the, in the journey of over probably, uh, 20 years in using LCA. Um, and going from drivers through to um, opportunities. Started off at the bottom left with understand our processes and our, and our product's environmental profile. We did um, a lot of time spending on, on, on data collection, which we did in conjunction with World Steel, um, to really get good data on the production impacts um, our products, and so that was developing the LCA methodology for, for dealing with um, new product processes uh, and allocation and issues like that. But we had the um, the data, we, we were able then to communicate that data to our customers, but also uh, third parties requesting data of the steel industry. And that enabled us then to engage, engage with with people uh, asking for data and to be obviously if they're asking for life cycle assessment data um, doing some L LCA studies so it enabled us to engage in, in their in their work where possible that us really on to looking at market sector models looking at beyond our factory gate to understand the full product life cycle and try to understand where steel sat relative to our competing um, materials. Um, obviously, there are other 
third-party LCA studies, so we wanted to be in a position to be able to respond to um, comparative assertions. And um, the way to do that was to have an understanding yourself of where you think you, you uh, perform. Um, and going on beyond that, where we start to become, in, in, I guess, more positive opportunities was really understanding um, different um, the different methodologies in LCA on our product uh, performance, but also an opportunity to engage in policy development and um, standards development to make sure uh, the standards fairly represented uh, steel products. Um, following on from that, where, which is where we are now really, is really some customers in their sort of sustainability uh, goals using LCA for marketing um, products and also to some extent in, in new product developments, uh, developing uh, more holistic sustainability assessment uh, tools to actually try to assess at fairly early stage in the product development where you spent some weaknesses lie for, for certain products and that might trigger uh, an LCA study for that product development. So going on to my next slide, it's really about uh, all those CO2 steel making. This is a, a multi-part in the project. I don't know if you can uh, see the animation. The, the project is about how to achieve a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions um, from virgin steel uh, production by 2050. And the, um, this is a multi part research project. Um, so we've used LCA in, in this project to really assess different process technologies um, in terms of what is their potential CO2 performance, but all looking at other environmental impacts, so you're not shifting burdens, as Alex said, onto, uh, away from CO2 onto other aspects, for example. Uh, so there are four main technologies in the in, in project. You can find more at oldcost.org. Um, uh, one of them is called smelting reduction, which is a, a, a pilot process we're piloting um, um, Netherlands, and that is taking taking really taking three steps of uh, steel making and combining it into into one process, which uh, should cut a significant amount of CO2 um, from the steel making. Um, we also used LCA in that in that um, project to so identify hot spots was part of that, but also looking at different scenarios uh, in the future. So, for example, one process technology was uh, on electrolysis, which uses large amounts of electricity. And that, that, that technology is only really viable where you've got a low, car low um, carbon intensive um, electricity um, uh, mix. And so you could look at different scenarios to, to uh, so that process would perform in the future. This main um, area where we've focused uh, LCA efforts is really understanding how steel performs in comparison with other materials. And this slide is, a, is an extract from a publication we did jointly with our construction supply chain partners to, to actually um, debate about the end-of-life aspects of products and construction products and we at the differences between um, concrete, timber and, and steel in terms of their end-of-life performance. Um, they, all, the, all each of these materials are recyclable but in different ways really. Uh, so for example, the concrete is typically crushed uh, and uh, then cycled into a, a, fill, a fill or an aggregate material and not back into, not necessarily back into concrete. 
and and tim might a significant amount of timber might uh, go to to landfill at end of life um and which there are some emissions associated with that and on the other hand steel is is fairly unique in that um, most of it is is recycled back into new steel products so really taking a cradle to cradle approach so it's not really losing uh, not losing uh, any material properties if you like so how does that translate into your LCA results and in, in environmental performance and what uh, LCA helps you to quantify so we look at the the uh, the life cycle beyond our factory gate we typically find that the use phase is, is the dominant phase in the LCA, uh, where, whether it's vehicles, buildings, food packaging, or, or in, um, in energy-related sectors. And it, it really highlights to, to Tata where, where the opportunities are for reducing the environmental performance of, of products throughout their life cycle. Where we can actually um, con contribute to the use phase, so that really focuses our efforts on things like advanced high strength steels, where we can lightweight vehicles, for example, to, to save fuel, um, and and also uh, in construction, um, developing uh, products that are, are more thermally efficient or can actually generate uh, renewable energy. Or for example, in electrical steels, we, we can develop steels that um, make motors and transformers more energy efficient. So, so that really um, helps with the, the marketing of our products, but also with the, with the, the product development. One particular project in, in construction where we, we spent a lot of time with our, with our partners in, in a project called Tar Target Zero. That was a, a project with the British Construction Steelwork Association, uh, Cyril Sweet and ACOM. And the idea behind that project was to try and show how to achieve zero carbon buildings using a series of case studies. Um, so we looked at a school, a warehouse, a supermarket, office, and a mixed-use building. Um, for each of those buildings, we really tried to demonstrate um, what are the most cost-effective um, energy efficiency measures and uh, renewable technology measures that could be put together to help achieve a zero-carbon building. Um, but so how, how to achieve um, cost-effectively high BREAM scores for the building sustainability assessment um, method uh, called BREAM. Um, and one part of the project which involved LCA um, was actually looking at the uh, old structural forms. So what would happen if you change the, the structural materials or the structural design uh, of each of those buildings, and how how would that affect the embodied uh, the carbon of, of the building? Because obviously, as we're putting construction, the the use phase is is likely to come down quite quickly in terms of carbon emissions. And your material impacts become much more important, and that's, I think the the project was really trying to address that and try to inform people architects and, and engineers, designers about uh, these different aspects and try to give a, a route, a road map, if you like, to, uh, to zero carbon uh, buildings. So information is available to you on t the Target Zero website, targetzero.info. Uh, let's go through a few pages uh, that are sort of available on, on the website. There's some uh, reports. So there's a, a guidance report that was produced from the work we did that analyzes, um, for example,
example, here's the warehouse uh, summary results. Um, the the, the, the um, energy efficiency measures uh, could achieve a 54% reduction in regulated emissions based on a, a, a 2006 compliant building. Could save also save you some costs as well in uh, life cycle costs. Also, the costing for achieving a BREAM outstanding. So the LCA was reported in terms of what the effect of different structural options. Um, for example, looking at the uh, a cast concrete and glue lamb uh, frame building or uh, a north light design to the warehouse to increase uh, uh, increase lighting. So behind those reports, there's also some quite detailed work with the LCA study actually breaks down the the, the results um, even further. So really looking at where in the building does the embodied do the embodied carbon impacts come from? And you can see the, the main impacts are coming from from the patients and floor slab and uh, sort of external site works like, like um, uh, lorry parks and things like that for, for the warehouse. So the um, really sh sort of bags up that this is where uh, you, you, the focus of um, embodied, if I, if I don't reduce embodied impacts, uh, you'd do well to focus on foundations and floor slab for the for a single story uh, warehouse. You might think that most of the impacts in, are in the parts you can see in a, in a building, but it, but it's in that fact it turned out to be the bits you can't see that um, have the biggest impact. Going on to um, EPDs, this is a fairly chunky piece of work that's been going on for about years now. It, it really started on looking at pre-painted steel and uh, its use in cladding applications. So we've ended up with environmental product de declarations on on systems. Um, but we started off with looking at the different paint systems and comparing Aryan branded color coat uh, painted steel with um, with uh, with different systems that maybe last last as long in terms of their corrosion performance. So we found in the LCA study that obviously the longer your lasted in terms of corrosion performance, less maintenance you had to do in the use phase. And that inspired in, in terms of um, VOC emissions to be quite significant because we were finding the, the, the maintenance repaints, we uh, were applying VOC emissions, which were then released to the atmosphere. Whereas when we actually apply the initial coating, it's done in factory conditions and the VOCs are collected and uh, droid, and we regenerate the. the, the Recap the energy uh, from that process, but during the maintenance in, in use, um, these VOCs are, are released. So, we'll to actually develop jointly develop a low VOC paint as a as a sort of a spin-off from that piece piece of work. But also it spurned us on to, to offer more corrosion, uh, better corrosion performance on our on our premium branded products. So we're now offering product lasts up to 40 years. Um, moving on from that, we've taken the LCA model a step further. We've introduced other cladding systems, so different ways of actually putting these uh, these these roofs and walls together. Um, and we have a tool now that can actually uh, we can clearly change certain parameters within the um, Within the model, to assess the effect of different uh, insulation thicknesses because each job is unique uh, for a particular building, um, and different uh, thicknesses of steel, etc. And quickly generate an EPD for that particular project or, or, or system, and we offer that to our supply chain 
same partners, so not only uh, the profilers who within Tata, but also profilers that we supply steel to. So the sort of a value-added service that we we offer, and it allows um, it enables another service called Confidex Sustain, which which actually enables building owners to offset the carbon emissions of that building uh, based on the the calculation done with the EPD. Yeah, my last slide is just trying to summarize the benefits. Um, talked a bit about hotspots and trying to understand your process and how your product performs over its life cycle is really key. And that, it does take an, a, a fair amount of work to, to get to that point. The next uh, really um, key aspect is enabling us to engage with stakeholders, whether it be external LCA studies, promoting good practice, um, engaging in standards and products development, uh, product policy development. But also key is really being able to support the customer in raising their goals because they're increasingly becoming aware of the um, important LCA, so it's good to be to be able to talk from a point of knowledge on that. And uh, but not least is really supporting the Tata brand and our values um, as a, a responsible supplier. We try to focus on customer needs and also try to differentiate uh, our products so we can use LCA to actually highlight those those differences. In our products. And I think that's all I have to say, but I'll hand you back to Alex. Thank you. Yeah, thank Nick. Uh, that, that was great. Um, so uh, I think really then uh, what I'd like to um, to, to tell through then, just, just to, to wrap up really what Nick was talking about, is um, trying to, to, to bring it, uh, the, what we've seen back to some of these issues that I highlighted in the in the um, drivers and opportunities section um, at the beginning. So uh, I think really what um, Tata have uh, found is that by um, uh, in terms of conducting LCA studies, um, uh, that their ability to uh, understand how how their um, material compared with uh, with other materials was uh, gave them an opportunity to demonstrate its environmental attributes and ultimately. That's about building, you know, brand equity, but also about um, improving the environmental performance. Uh, all you know, LCA has really supported Tata's um, efforts uh, in terms of its, its ability to engage with its supply chain, and also its, its marketing, uh, and, and so this is a, a key part of that. Really, looking up and downstream to try and um, work more closely um, with its with its customers in terms of the, the great example there of. Um, improving cladding panels, providing EPDs, and so on and so forth, and, and providing these low VOC emission products, and, and so on. I think then also in terms of supporting the decision-making process itself, and, you know, Tata has, has built these these uh, fairly detailed models, but is now looking to to move beyond that and, and start to uh, take some really informed decisions. Uh, obviously, we saw the all-cost case where they were looking at. Um, uh, trying to, to support decision making in that sense and minimizing the associated risks. Uh, and then also in terms of identifying hotspots in the steel value chain, um, trying to reduce energy and resource costs from an like point also from a from an environmental point of view um and how they've managed to to, to do all of that. So that's kind of what Nick has, has hopefully demonstrated is that LCA really does try and underpin their whole um, sustainability effort in terms of uh, you know, these these different drivers and opportunities um, that Tata has, and um, you know I think that uh, as they move forward, they're looking to continue that, that, that journey and try to really maximise um, maximise uh, those opportunities and and keep on doing what they've been doing for, for a number of now. Um, so I thank everyone for listening. Um, 
a few questions have already come in, which is great. Uh, and, and Nick and I will, will look forward to responding to those uh, in a few minutes. Um, Vanessa? Yes, thanks so much, Alex, for that, and um, I'd like to thank Nick for the presentation as well. So um, now we're going to go ahead and jump into our Q&A session. So like I had said earlier to all our attendees out there, submit your question by typing into the Q&A box. Um, and Alex, I think you said that you saw a few questions that have just come in, so I'm going to go ahead and read the ones that have gotten into the Q&A box, and then any others that have made it into the chat box. Um, so um, our first question. For the comparison between concrete, wood, and steel, what embodied energies that the production brings with it? I think this was directed towards Nick. Nick, have any? Um, yeah. yep. um, for that particular project, the, the focus was on uh, embodied carbon uh, and CO2 um, because, because that's what the building regulations are really driving towards is zero carbon buildings, uh, not necessarily zero energy. But um, within LCA, it's perfectly possible to, to calculate the embodied energy uh, in terms of megajoules. Um, it's that's available within the, the LCA results. Um, I think the, the you say embodied carbon is a is a is a very similar to embodied energy because the, the embodied carbon is is calculation of the carbon emissions from all the energy sources that are used throughout the life cycle of that uh, of those products um, in the building. So it sort of it would sort of give you the same uh, same messages because they really go hand in hand. Um, you know, I think also if I could just just add that I think that one of the other things that's interesting in terms of the um, material flow analysis that, that Nick was presenting there is to try and highlight that there's very different performance in different parts of the life cycle from those, those three materials, concrete, timber, and steel. So, uh, I mean, I think in terms of we were uh, talking about the quantification of, of waste and so on and so forth and, and how those flows are separated out, um, I think that was kind of one of the, the things that's interesting about that diagram that the three materials have uh, obviously, they'll have quite different um, embodied, they might have different embodied energies, uh, embodied carbons, but they also perform quite differently during parts of their life cycle. So that's kind of another, another aspect, I think, that's, that's worth considering. And I think that's what that way diagram does, the material flow diagram does so nicely, is, is so where those um, waste flows are going and, and you know, what potential consequences of that might be. I think there's a quick little follow-up question from that. Um, but is this higher or lower for wood, concrete, or steel? Sorry. Um, yeah. Nick, have any comments on that? Sure. It's it's the fun question. There's a bit of a follow-up to this to the first question. Um, is this high or lower for wood, concrete, or steel? Well, um, I think if you if you go to the um, Target Zero website, you'll see the results, but. Uh, I think, um, in, in most in most of the uh, options, um, the steel steel option came out slightly lower um, than the other two options. But um, there is a bit of sensitivity around assumptions, and, and um, those assumptions are really talked about in the, in the reports. And we can find the reports on the website. Um, yeah, for the target zero oh. dot info. Oh, great. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next question. What about the social considerations? In many cases, multinational company resources are getting from Latin America and do not take care of the negative social impacts they generate there, river pollution, erosion, forced displacement. Um, LCA, should LCA consider the social aspect? Uh, Alex, do you have any thoughts on that? And then Nick? Um, yeah, uh, so I mean, thanks, thanks for that question. It's, it's a really really good and really key point and actually I, I um, the answer is uh, that you must take account of the social considerations at the same time as looking at the environmental and the economic. I think that in terms of um, the body of work that's out there, social um, aspects have probably been a little bit slower to, to cap 
and that's been for, for a number of different reasons. I think there's been a lack of a good quality data in the past, and also and some of the bulk resource companies um, operating in some of the areas you, you, you mentioned may have been a little bit further away from um, customers and stakeholders in the past. So perhaps they haven't experienced the level of um, you know queries and so on that they have they, that they have up to now. But I think that um, an increasing number of studies which do take uh, real account of these. Um, there's a, a number of different efforts ongoing to try and um, re incorporate some aspects more more into into LCAs. So there's a um, the, the International Council for Mining and Metals are, um, are trying to develop some some sort of agreements with uh, across different metals. There's also individual um, mining associations um, and commodities who are trying to put together some some responsible frameworks and so on. So Forth. In terms of incorporating them side by side with an LCA, um, I think that the data is going to be the, the key thing there, and there's also no great uh, agreement across the board on, on how these should be quantified. But um, it, it's an excellent question. I think it has to, it, it's coming, and I think that LCA will um, incorporate all three pillars more and more in the future. Um, but at the moment, I mean, I think, I think. Uh, Nick, you might be able to talk about this, but I think yeah. within the all cost project, did you not, not with social issues not included in there as, as well? I think they were, weren't they? Yes, I think uh, social in terms of like uh, empo employment and things like that. That that they tried to make it as holistic as possible, uh, as well as economic. Um, we 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 are we are trying to build in. Uh, obviously, LCA is really designed for environmental impacts, but we're really trying to combine LCA with social assessments and uh, life cycle costing assessments to really get a, a full picture. And so we've been involved in projects like SOVAMAT, which is really looking at value metrics for um, assessing uh, products. But also I think BS8905 rings a bell as well. I think we've been involved in that, and that's looking at sustainability aspects of materials and how to to bring bring all these aspects into into your uh, assessment. Uh, the other thing I should say is that the the Europe there are European standards being developed uh, in construction in sustainable construction, and one of the standards is a social standard on on how to assess the social performance of of buildings, but uh, it's quite limited in its scope. Um, so we are looking how to um, really quantify this uh, and, and help you um, be able to pair different systems on a, on a social basis. Okay, thanks for both of your responses. Um, I have a few more questions here to go through. So, um, so this is Nick. Um, Nick, why did you begin using LCA? Uh, you said you used it for 23 years now. Yeah, I, I think when we first started, it was really about uh, data collection um, and responding to inquiries because um, uh, in the, like the late 80s, early 90s, we started data collecting with World Steel, uh, the World Steel Association, to get um, a good foothold on, on where, what is data for steel and how, how do we as a company compare with our peers, so that's where it started. Um, it, it quickly snowballs into uh, lots of other areas. Okay, so that um, the next question. Um, I think this was during Nick's uh, presentation, but Alex, if you could also uh, have some input here. How can you use LCA for new product development? I think you touched upon this a little bit, Nick. Yeah. Um, Um, it, it would be difficult to do LCA for each new product development, but um, what we might get to a point where is um, with to, uh, an LCA t tool that can actually be the performance uh, of different products. So rather than having to generate a, a new LCA, you'd use a, a tool that actually 
testive aspects of a product, and maybe if it's the product changing the use phase, then you, you only have to focus on that part. Um, so we're at the stage where we're doing LCA of every new product development, but we, we have a, a, a sustainability assessment tool that we can, through a series of uh, detailed questions, really identify where we're strong and weak uh, on the sustainability aspects. And if environmental performance shows a potential opportunity or a weakness, we could we could then initiate further detailed LCA study to actually try and find out, um, you know, where exactly uh, we sit in terms of trying to get a, a credible answer. Thank you, Nick. And do you have any comments on that? I mean, I, I think a lot of what Nick said um, really applies a lot of, a lot of what we see. So when we work with, with um, uh, you know, natural companies, we we often see that they they use a lot more uh, increasingly for, for improvements. I mean, obviously the, the great um, uh, one of the great issues with with some LCAs is that they come at the end of of a new product development. So all they can really tell people is is that they you know what the impact is, but perhaps it'll be another product development round before they can start to improve it. So companies are looking to try and um, gather at least data to conduct what we might call a screening LCA um, at the beginning or during the design process. So this is kind of what Nick's saying, that to try and get at least an idea of where the, where the biggest issues um, might be, to try and flag up anything at an early stage when you perhaps don't have all of the data, but you might have a reasonable idea of what the product's going to finally look like. I mean, another thing which, which is also um, happening is um, uh, the integration of environmental um, information or into uh, some design tools. So uh, SolidWorks, um, we worked with SolidWorks at PE, um, and they've integrated um, they've integrated some of our um, environmental data and some of our content into um, their own product to allow. Um, people to at least get a, an idea of what the uh, the approximate environmental um, impact of the, of the product they're designing might be. So by specifying it's made of this material, it's going to weigh this much, and it'll be made in this manner to give them at least an idea. So so yeah, I mean it's it's certainly something which more and more companies are are going to do and and find innovative ways to do it. So I think I'm probably going to wrap up with a very final. Um, Pretty easy. Uh, last question. Uh, where can one find the guidance report? Um, I think that was shown in Nick's presentation. Um, I think it, the website's targetzero.info. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so I think um, we'll go ahead and close the session for the day. Um, so right now, uh, I'd just like to go ahead and thank all of our attendees for participating today, for your questions, comments, and ideas. Thanks to both Alex and Nick for your great presentations. Thanks so much for joining us today. So the recording and relevant info will be posted shortly on the Supply Chain Working Group on the Two Degrees site, so you'll be able to view the webinar recording afterwards at your leisure. Many thanks again to everyone, and have a wonderful day.